Ukraine is a mess. Don't blame Donald Trump for that. Well, you know, one minute. Ja, wir brauchen die NATO. Wir sind everywhere, from Lithuania to the Sahel, to Afghanistan, to Iraq, to Lebanon. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Welcome back to War and Peace. I'm your host, Olga Olaker. And I'm your co-host, Hugh Pope. And here in the studio with us is Andrei Kurtinov. Andrei is the Director General of the Russian International Affairs Council, which is one of Russia's premier think tanks. And we're very excited to have him here for an opportunity to talk about what happened in 2019 and what we might be looking forward to in 2020. Welcome, Andrei. Thank you. I'm flattered. So 2019 was a really big year for Russian foreign policy. Let's talk a little bit about that. Do you think it was a watershed? Was it a real turning point for Russia? Well, I wouldn't say it was a watershed, but I think that uh, there were some positive developments which sometimes we do not notice. They're not major ones, uh, but uh, if you can find some positive signs, you can definitely do that. So what are the positive signs for Russia? Well, uh, first, uh, Russia uh, got back to the Council of Europe. Mm -hmm. It wasn't an easy decision for both sides. I think there was opposition in Europe and it was opposition in Russia, but nevertheless, Russia rejoined the family. I think that uh, Putin confirmed the Russia's participation to the Paris agreements on climate. I think it is significant, though, of course, the devil is in details, and we don't know how it turns out, but I think it is a positive sign. Russia and the West were almost able to agree on Moldova. Uh, the I coalition. think they agreed on Moldova. It was well, Moldova that failed to agree. <laughs> that's probably the, the right way to put it. But of course, they will blame it on Putin that, you know, he had uh, this sinister plan uh, from the very outset. He didn't believe that it would work. But definitely, I think there was an attempt um, and we came closer than mm -hmm. any time before to fixing the situation in Moldova. I would uh, also add to that uh, we had some moderate progress on the gas issue. Uh, which is more controversial mm -hmm. because uh, it's still unclear. You how mean Nord, the Nord Stream 2 The Nord Stream, but also transit, uh, okay. the Ukrainian transit. It's not a done deal, but I think uh, that uh, there was uh, some modest uh, progress uh, on that. You can also argue that um, on Ukraine in general, there is a positive movement, though I would say that it's probably not because of Russia, but because of the uh, election cycle in Ukraine and the election of Vladimir Zelensky, who is really committed mm -hmm. to making peace in Donbass. And uh, definitely this is something that uh, might uh, be somehow capitalized uh, uh, later on in mm -hmm. 2020 if all the sides have the political will to do that. In your list of successes, you don't put Syria or the revived relationship with Turkey. That's not top issues for you? Well, I would say that these are important issues. And on Syria, what I would say as a positive sign that we avoided the most negative scenarios. You know, there was no major Syrian offensive in Idlib, for example, no use of chemical weapons uh, this year. The uh, southwest Syria didn't implode, though there are problems there. And even the Kurdish issue didn't uh, turn into a really, you know, bad situation in the northeast. So I think that we were really? able... Fairly bad situation. Well, I mean, the situation definitely is not good. If you're Kurdish, good. it's particularly it's, you know, bad. That's right. But, you know, there was no, let me say, there was no massacre in the Northeast, uh, which is, of course, a very low, <laughs> <laughs> low, uh, low criteria for success. But uh, also, we shouldn't forget that uh, after so many years, the Constitutional Committee started working in Geneva. Mm -hmm. Again, you know, we cannot expect miracles, but it, at least uh, it is something. For Russia, I think uh, another important event was uh, the summit uh, with Africa, mm -hmm. you know, a major event. You know, we have almost uh, 50 African leaders coming to Sochi, unprecedented. Whether it turns out to be a real game change in Africa, we don't know, but at least something. And uh, we had uh, a good year in Russian-Chinese relations. Uh, the power of Siberia pipeline mm -hmm. finally got into operation. Again, uh, it's not a breakthrough, but definitely it is a positive development for Russia. So in Syria, these successes, how much of that is a product of Russian diplomacy, Russian foreign policy? Well, Russia is uh, arguably the most active power broker mm -hmm. in Syria today. And whatever happens here cannot uh, happen without some participation from Moscow. Definitely, 
there are problems, and uh, I can see some growing tensions between Moscow and Damascus. My feeling is that uh, the Syrian regime is getting more confident, if not more arrogant. Mm -hmm. So it is a problem. I think the relations with uh, Iran are fragile. Iran shows signs of impatience. You know, they want mm -hmm. more support uh, from Moscow. On the other hand, um, uh, the current um, political changes in Israel might uh, erode this uh, personal foundation of the Russian-Israeli mm -hmm. partnership. So there are many issues that might uh, disrupt uh -huh. uh, the status quo. But the year 2019 was a positive year in the sense that Russia consolidated its influence uh, in the Middle East. And, of course, Putin's trip to Saudi Arabia and to Emirates was just another manifestation that everybody wants to deal with Moscow. Well, we're still on the positive side. December saw this big NATO summit, and uh, one of the biggest problems there was this apparent split with Turkey. Now, Russia must be delighted at the way it's managed to peel Turkey away from NATO. Is that a success? You haven't put that high on your mm -hmm. list. Maybe Putin believes it. To be a success, but if I were to advise Putin, I would say you'd better keep Turkey within NATO uh, rather than uh, take it out of NATO, uh, because uh, definitely uh, Turkey has very serious implications for NATO, and at the same time, uh, it uh, might be a bridge uh, to Brussels if you want to use it under certain circumstances. The Russian-Turkish relations uh, are on the bumpy road. We saw ups and downs. But the year of uh, 2019, I think, generally speaking, was positive. And uh, in January of 2020, Erdogan will officially launch uh, the Turkish gas stream. Symbolically, it's an important step, and uh, it will, to some extent, uh, compensate uh, for failures if there are failures uh, on other gas issues with the European Union. So Venezuela, failure, success... Unclear yet? That was another big Russian endeavor, let's say, in 2019. Well, I hate to serve as a salesman for Mr. Putin, but uh, I have to confess that, uh, at least in my view, it was a success uh, in the sense uh, that uh, if you remember the situation some six months ago, Many people didn't believe that Maduro would stay for too mm -hmm. long. The perception was that uh, the regime will implode and uh, that the opposition will take over and that there is no way Russia or Russia together with China can rescue uh, Maduro and his regime. But it appears that uh, the regime uh, has demonstrated more resilience than uh, many had anticipated. And uh, I think that um, if you take a very pragmatic mm -hmm. position, Russia was right uh, not to abandon Maduro mm -hmm. and uh, to stick to their guy. Yeah. So would he have uh, made it without Russia? Mm, I'm not sure, though, again, mm -hmm. Russia is not the only player right. in this game, and uh, we should uh, remember China, but we should also remember Cuba. I think that uh, the Cuban influence in Venezuela is often underestimated, but it is very significant. So 2019 was a terrible year for arms control. Oh, yes. What that means for Russia. The United States left the INF Treaty, as did Russia, you know, and in response, the treaty is dead. The United States accused Russia of violating it. Russia accused the United States of violating it. The United States basically said they were willing to stay in the treaty if Russia got rid of the system that the United States said was in violation. The Russians weren't willing to do this, and it all falls apart. Victory for Russia, loss for Russia? You know, let me give you a story. You know, I'm old enough uh, to remember how the United States uh, decided to withdraw from ABM. I remember uh, that too, yeah, oddly. You, <laughs> well, uh, you were just a, a graduate student, maybe. Uh, but hmm. I was already. <laughs> no, no, no. I was fully grown, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, okay. But I was uh, you know, marginally involved in these conversations uh, with some of my American counterparts, and uh, we spent many hours in Pentagon, you know. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine, you know, a Russian Pentagon? I remember it, Russians in the Pentagon. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, I was one of them. And uh, I do remember that uh, at that point, Russia really wanted to save ABM. Yes, absolutely. And everything was done in order to do that. And the it, United States really wanted out. And the United States really wanted out. But uh, I could feel uh, the commitment on the Russian side that we should do whatever is needed. We would cover an extra mile. We would uh, amend the treaty. We will introduce new verification mechanisms. We would do whatever the United States once, short of, you know, withdrawing from the treaty. So I felt this commitment. Uh, 
Today, with the INF, frankly, I didn't feel this commitment. Maybe I missed something. Maybe mm -hmm. I was not directly engaged, and that's why I am not in a position to judge. But uh, looking at the situation from the outside, uh, I couldn't see the same commitment uh, as I saw uh, almost 20 years mm -hmm. ago with the ABM Treaty. So the conclusion that I make is that, uh, well, probably Putin would prefer to keep uh, uh, the treaty, but he was not ready to pay a high price mm -hmm. for keeping the treaty. And the way how they approached U.S. Uh, concerns uh, probably uh, was not sensitive enough. Again, you know, I understand that Russians have their own concerns about how the United States uh, stick uh, or does not stick to the INF Treaty. But definitely we should have demonstrated a little bit more sensitivity if we wanted uh, to keep the treaty. Is that because the INF Treaty is simply not as important as the ABM Treaty was? I mean, it's arguably out of date. Regardless, there's a lot of frustration, and there has been for a long time in both Moscow and Washington about it. Unlike ABM, which I think in Russia really was seen as part and parcel of strategic stability, it's harder to make that argument for INF. Well, that's probably right. I think that uh, the... ABM Treaty was much more fundamental in terms of the whole concept of strategic stability. It was much more important than INF. But uh, I'm afraid, again, uh, it's not the official Russian position, mm -hmm. as you might guess, but I'm afraid that arms control in general is not as high at the list of Russian priorities as it was 20 years ago. So we uh, have sort of parallel tracks in Washington and in Moscow. Mm -hmm. People uh, especially top political leaders would probably like to have treaties uh, if these treaties uh, mean political victories for them. But uh, in terms of security, uh, probably they are less ready to rely on arms control mm -hmm. as the foundation for their national security. So I think that uh, what we see right now is a growing trend uh, towards uh, nuclear isolationism in the United States, but also in Russia. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. This is War and Peace, and we're talking to Andrei Kurtinov of the Russian International Affairs Council. So if we're looking at less interest in arms control on all sides, what does that mean for the last big treaty? I mean, there are a few other bits and pieces of arms control still left, but the big treaty that's still left is the New START Treaty, the follow-on to the Starch Treaties, which themselves followed on to the SALT Treaties. They, together with ABM, were the building blocks of arms control for so many years. New START is due to expire in 2021, beginning of 2021. Does Russia want to keep it? Uh, well, I think that uh, generally, other things being equal, Russia would prefer to have this treaty. And one of the manifestations uh, of this intention uh, is what happened uh, in the end of 2019, when uh, Russians uh, showed Americans uh, their right. avant-garde mm -hmm. system, I think it was a signal. Look, folks, you know, you want to see our systems, you want to have a look mm -hmm. at our gadgets, welcome. Keep, keep, and keep the treaty. And keep the treaty. This treaty is what uh, lets you see these things. I, I think so. I think that uh, they would prefer to keep the treaty, and I think it's much more important than INF, with all due respect. It's really the remaining core mm -hmm. of the U.S.-Russian arms control. Uh, however, in Moscow, there is a lot of pessimism. And when I encounter people from the foreign ministry or from other agencies, they're not very optimistic about uh, the ability to save the treaty. I think that the perception is that um, the United States is not going to extend it. So that's depressing. I want to go back to the INF story just very briefly. The people who are most worried about the death of INF are not Americans or Russians, of course, because the Americans and Russians let the treaty die. They're Europeans who think that some of these missiles might hit them. And I think that's part of what's been behind some of the European initiatives to try to start talking to Russia. Is that potentially the basis for conversations about a new security order in Europe? Is there hope for that? And could 2020 be a year for it? Well, first of all, I think that um, everybody is interested in some form of arms control. The United States and the Russians and Europeans should understand that uh, arms race is dangerous. 
Not that we will have um, huge numbers of warheads and uh, delivery vehicles, but uh, everybody should be interested uh, in some form of arms control because uh, if we have a renewed arms race, especially in high tech, you take uh, space or you take uh, cyber or autonomous uh, lethal systems or something like that, uh, that would destabilize the situation. Americans can count on their technological edge, but risks will grow for the United States as well. So there should be an interest in getting back to arms control. The question is, uh, what kind of arms control are we looking for? And in Russia, at least, uh, there is a very emotional discussion about arms control and uh, part of this discussion, uh, not a major player, but uh, some people believe that uh, what we need to do is to get back to where we were, basically when? turn of the century, okay. that we should start uh, with extending the New START Treaty, we should somehow restore INF, resurrect it from the ashes, or at least we should commit uh, not uh, to go beyond the limitations of the treaty de facto. Mm -hmm. Uh, we uh, should uh, find uh, some agreement uh, on uh, BMD. And conventional you, forces. And, of course, conventional forces. But basically, you know, in theory, this is doable. But uh, what does it tell us about China? What does it tell us about third nuclear powers? And uh, the reality is that uh, what we see right now is a very different ball game. It's no longer about numbers. It's no longer about deployments, it's about mobility, it's about precision, it's about firepower. So that's what we have to keep in mind, that nobody really knows how to do that. But Andre, aren't things rather different from the good old days of proper arms control? As you were alluding to, you have this multiplication of players, you have this extraordinary new varieties of threat that need to really be woven into any sustainable system. And all that depends on some kind of multilateral setup, which seems to me in 2020, if the current trends go on, the multilateral system will further fracture. Is Russia comfortable with that? Will it do anything to save the multilateral system? I can say that I'm not comfortable. <laughs> I can talk uh, on behalf of Russia, and I think nobody can. But uh, definitely we are entering a very dangerous period. I would even say some kind of a death zone which we have to cross before we can get to some kind of arms control. Uh, but let me tell you that uh, this multilateral agenda looks uh, almost impossible right now. But uh, if we dig into that, uh, if we compartmentalize it, if we slice it into smaller pieces, probably it's not that impossible. Uh, let me tell you about uh, Chinese, because uh, every time you know we have conversations with Chinese and we somehow in a very delicate way indicate that it would be great for you to somehow join arms control mm -hmm. because China is an important country and uh, its uh, defense budget is growing. So why don't you guys join us? The average reaction, the standard reaction from Chinese is that, well, you know, you, you should be kidding because look at our nuclear arsenal. And by the way, we will not tell you how many weapons we have. <laughs> but believe us, it is very small. Uh, with our very small <laughs> arsenal, uh, we cannot really join these uh, big uh, discussions between Russians and Americans. But the reality is that it's not about numbers. Uh, when we're talking mm -hmm. about Chinese and arms control, it should not necessarily mean that we impose on them any rigid limitations on the numbers of their missiles or warheads. The question is about predictability, it's about uh, confidence building, it's about information exchange, it's about uh, hotlines, it's about the alerting maybe. So it's uh, about a very different type of arms control which will not necessarily compromise the independence of the Chinese strategic posture. And new technologies, I would think. And new technologies, of course. And again, you know, you, you go to Beijing and uh, you will find a receptive audience there when you talk about technologies, when you talk about space, when you talk about cyber or artificial intelligence. All this, of course, will need confidence and, as you said, small steps. You've done a lot of work recently on reconstruction in Syria, which is a messy, nasty, low-tech war with barrel bombs, which you 
possibly have imagined five, ten years ago. Do you think that there's a possibility that Russia and Europe can come to any kind of common ground to get Syria back on its feet? Well, I believe that uh, probably we cannot uh, breach the gap in our perceptions of what should be done that today and tomorrow in Syria, but we can narrow this gap. Russia can and probably should exercise uh, more pressure on Damascus in terms of uh, taking the Constitutional Committee in a more serious way than they do right now. It should incentivize Damascus to take uh, a more benign attitude uh, towards refugees. And uh, Europe might consider, if not lifting completely, at least uh, changing somewhat its sanctions policy towards Syria. And that would already be a major, major accomplishment. Later on, we can uh, probably do more together, but we should also engage Iranians without Iran. You know, no Mm. deal in Syria is likely to work. Uh, We have uh, to engage others. And, of course, we should keep in mind that the United States can always be a spoiler. So at least (laughs) we need some kind of, you know, positive Mm. neutrality Mm -hmm. coming from Washington, because otherwise, without the United States, it would be difficult. So prospects for peace in Syria in 2020 are if the Russians and the Europeans can find a way forward and neutralize American tendencies towards spoiling any progress. Well, the other option is uh, to give uh, Trump a big victory. But I don't know how to do that in Syria. I'm not sure what victory for Trump would be in Syria. Well, you know, something that would justify a Nobel Peace Prize for him. So tell us, you counted at least six successes for Russia in in 2019. (laughs) You've given us a possible tiny step in Syria, perhaps if fortune smiles in arms control. What big opportunities do you see elsewhere for Russia in 2020? Well, I think that uh, uh, we might... uh, have uh, new success stories with Chinese. I think there is uh, not very fast, uh, but uh, steady progress in the economic relations. They are getting more diverse, which is definitely good uh, for us. In some cases, uh, we might compete successfully with the United States, with other major uh, partners of China. I think that Russia today might play not a key role, but a relatively important role in the North Korean settlement hmm. because uh, it seems that uh, next year or you know, the year of 2020 will be a hard year for the Korean problem. I can imagine some bumps on the road uh, for Trump because he expects too much and he's not likely to get it. So that creates opportunities for a variety of reasons. Chinese might be more cautious than Russians because Chinese do not want to complicate their relations with the United States even more because of North Korea. So that creates an opportunity for Russia to play a more active role there. I think this is uh, definitely uh, important. I think that when we talk uh, about Middle East, we shouldn't limit ourselves to Syria only. I think that there are some chances to get progress. It is not easy, but there are chances to have some progress in Yemen. I'm more skeptical about Libya, but again, I I would be happy to be uh, wrong uh, there. But uh, I think that uh, definitely uh, the Russian policy in 2020 is likely to be opportunistic rather than strategic. From all that you're saying, many of these opportunities could be huge risks as well. Oh, yeah. No, but again, you know, my take is that uh, the Russian policy will be more risk evasive. Uh, For example, I don't envisage another military operation of the Syrian type anywhere else. I don't see Russia involved in Afghanistan uh, or in Sudan. Mm -hmm. Uh, Of course, you know... uh, Central African Republic. Central African Republic. Let me say, I don't... I should probably qualify uh, what I have just said. I don't envision the Russian Minister of Defense uh, Mm -hmm. (laughs) being directly involved in such places. And I hope that we will not see Solberg's in 2020 that uh, the uh, approach to the European Union will be very cautious. And again, I do hope that uh, the United States uh, will not identify any major Russian involvement in 2020 elections. I do hope that uh, it will not be the case. Do you think Mr. Putin wants to win in November 2020? (laughs) I think that uh, for him, stakes are not that high, because even if Trump wins, it doesn't really change the attitude of the U.S. political establishment towards Putin and towards Moscow. Do you think anyone in Putin's inner circle is thinking about the prospects 
of somebody else coming to power and changing policy towards Russia? Or is that just so low probability that it's not worth considering the sort of the Nixon goes to China model? In the United States? In the United States. <clears throat> that the Democrats can come to power and decide to really change things around because they're in a position to change things in a way the Republicans would not be. I think that one of the problems with the Russian policy towards the United States is that uh, for Moscow, for many, many years, symmetry was the only game in town. They always relied on mm -hmm. working with the White House. I personally tried many times to convince people who matter in Moscow that uh, we should broaden our horizons and we should reach out for faults on the mm -hmm. hill to the Democratic Party in this particular case, but uh, most importantly to the American society. Because if you don't change the attitudes of ordinary Americans towards the Russians, Trump will not help you and Biden will not help. Nobody will help you. So, But I think that the perception is that uh, you know, the two presidents get together, they look into into eyes of each other, they fix relations, and then relations stop to get better. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, Trump basically uh, proved that it's no longer how it works. It's not just about the United States, but with the United States in particular, uh, Russia has to master its ability to go beyond the top level. And will 2020 be the year it does that? Well, if... I were in charge. <laughs> I would say, yeah, sure, we sure. will do that. Okay. Andre, thank you so much. I think we're out of time, but this has been a really fascinating review of 2019 mm -hmm. and look forward into 2020. Mm -hmm. And couldn't imagine a better interlocutor to have this conversation with. Thanks so much for joining thank us. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, listeners, for tuning in to War and Peace. Big thanks to Bulle Media and Antoine LaRousse, our producer, um, Miranda Sonnex at Crisis Group, who makes sure that we make it to the studio at the same time and on schedule and uh, with some notes and so forth. And um, our biggest thanks, of course, to you, our listeners. Our big news for 2019 is that we got this podcast off the ground and we've had a great time doing it. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group.